I'm going to read an excerpt from the novel, and uh, what you need to know is that the novel set in Sogman, which is a mythical boomtown gone bust in the North Woods. And the narrator, Stefan, is an Agatha pastor, come home and leave his mother's funeral um, with his wife and his children. But the sections I'm going to read from, he's, uh, he's almost 10, his sister Marie is almost 8, and her father was elevated to the job of foreman of a log company, which is a position he got when a, a log crushed his hand. Um, that's more or less what we need to know about the book. And other things, like, you're on your own. Um, <laughs> I'm going to skip around a little bit, so keep up. <laughs> um, I should also say, of course, books are for sale. Um, Woo! So, yeah. Right, I thank you. <laughs> I should also say, this is the first thing I've got to do on, gotten to do on tour that's in a bar, and it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. because you read, you got a free year of it, so. Two. Two. <laughs> Even though we went to be with my father in the cuts during the summers, the winters were better, because at least then we had them to ourselves. School days he took to the mill, filing blades, checking the books, helping the assistant foreman pearl tend the horses. But he was home when we were, sitting at the stove at night, listening with us as my mother, a former school teacher at the Sodomite schoolhouse, read from her books. He carved small wooden toys for Marie, a rock horse, a whistle, using his destroyed hand to pin the block of wood to the table. Mostly, though, he told the story. I know that out in the cuts he was a different man. He had to be. He kept a man's respect and, in turn, they kept the saw blades coming through greenwood. Will their axes cut smiles into pines and strip branches from fallen trees? Will they wrap chains around the logs? My father moved through the woods, yelling, talking, making them laugh, taking the end of a saw when it was needed. He pushed them hard, and when they pushed back, he came home with bruises, an eye swollen shut, scabs on his knuckles. He made them listen. At home, he was gentle. At night, he told the stories about his father, how Genot found gold in the Sogma, and the long winter that followed the bust. He told us about the Qualiput and Anahuac, the trickster wolf god, about the loop guru and the blood drinking animals, about all the monsters and witches of the woods. He told us about other kinds of magic that stumbled across in the cuts. How sawdust grew wings and flew down men's shirts like mosquitoes. How one tree picked itself up and walked away from the sharp teeth of a saw. He told us about splitting open a log to find a fairy kingdom. About clearing an entire forest with one swing with axe. About the family trees we found twisted together, pushing toward the sky, graded in love. Our favorite story, however, the story that we always ask him to retell was about the year he finally convinced our mother to marry him. The last time I remember him telling the story was the spring before I turned ten. Every man in the throne of me and Pearl is served, he said. Oh, Pearl? Marie giggled, thinking of Pearl as I thought of him, riding the middle of the cloak with his close gray hair, bristling crazy from his scalp, yellow long underwear peeking from the cuffs of his shirt. My father had told the story so many times that Marie probably could recount it word for word by then. But like me, like our mother, she still laughed and clapped. Oh, Pearl! Oh, Pearl! My father roared, his teeth flashing. Oh, Pearl wasn't always old, he yelled happily. Old Pearl could sink any man who would laugh at you when he spun a log out from under your feet. And Mrs. Casser was happy to tell you about it, my mother said. She was happy as winter berries watching Dr. the boys. My mother smiled at this. She always smiled. Log rolling and saga was a tradition. Every year, the entire town came down to the river the day before the float. They carried blankets and baskets full of chicken, roasted onions and potatoes, bread, blueberry pies, strawberry wine. My father, and before him, Foreman Martin, would roll out a few barrels of beer, and the men took to the water. They spun logs, a man on either end, turning the wood to the peak faster and faster, stopping and spinning the other way until one, or sometimes both, pitched into the cold water to rock his cheers from the banks. Pearl won ever since I could remember, my father said. He'd never been unseated, but I had to win. He slapped the warm pine table with his mangled hand and winked at my mother. Oh, your mother was a clever one. He stood up from the table and hooked his arm around her waist, pulling her close to him and looking over her shoulder at Marie and me. She still is. He kissed her then, and surprised me to see my mother's cheeks redden. Before she pushed him away, she whispered something into his ear. He reddened as well. 
paused in a moment to watch her take the plates from the table. Pop up, Marie said, many more. Oh, you know all this already. She married me, he said, turning back to us and waving his hand. And here you are. Pop up, Marie said again, shaking her finger at him like her scorn. Tell it right, I said. He smiled and leaned over the top of his chair. She wouldn't marry me. But Mama, Marie asked, why didn't you love Papa? My father stopped and looked at my mother. This was not part of the story. Why didn't you love me, he said. You asked every girl in Sagamat to marry you, my mother answered. <laughs> but I only asked them once, he said, turning back to Marie. Your mother I asked every day. All the men had asked her to marry them, even some of the ones who were already married. But I kept asking you. Every day for three years I called on her at the boarding house, and every day I asked her to marry me. And she always said no. Marie reached out and cupped the withered fingers of my father's bad hand in her two hands. He sat down next to her. Mama, she asked again, why didn't you love Papa? I always loved him, sweetheart, she said, pouring hot water from the stove and the dish out. She leaned toward the steam that had washed across her face. I just didn't know it yet. So I kept asking her to marry me until one day she didn't say no. What did she say? Marie could not stop herself. She said the day she'd marry me was the day I got pearl into the water. I thought it was a safe bet, my mother said. Your father never could seem to stay dry. <laughs> my father was leaning back in his chair now, staring at the moon through the window. He'd taken his hand back from Marie, and he rubbed the fingers of his good hand across the back of a bad hand that's been eight. I wanted to hear about his triumph, how that was the year the logger spun so fast he could not see his feet, and how it was not until he heard a splash and a roar from the banks of the river that he knew he finally dumped the pearl to serve. I wanted to hear him describe the feel of the cold water when he dove from the land dove in the log and swam to the bank, the river dripping from his clothes as he walked to my mother. I wanted to see the wink he gave us when he said that our priest, Father Hugo, was asleep with drink and barrels of beer. I wanted to hear about Father Earl, who'd arrived from Ottawa only the day before and who was Anglican, and younger than my father, married, formed the wedding, right then and there on the bank of the Sarka. But before he could tell us that, before he could tell us how he had to leave the next morning for the float, and how he ran home all the way from Housham, running to his wife, I asked him, do you miss it? Do you miss the float? He looked at me for a moment as if he had not heard my question. And then my mother spoke. You and Marie washed up now. Get ready for bed. As I rose from the table, he stopped me. He raised his ruined hand, his fingers curled like a claw. I miss it, he said. He did not tell many stories for the next few weeks. And then when the snow finally melted enough for the men to take up the saws and axes and get into the woods, my father pushed them terribly, as if he knew how bad the coming winter would be. He kept them working from dawn to dusk with not a day's break until the first of September, when the trees were stacked and lined inside the mill. Um, and I'm just going to pay to you now, uh, and it's winter now, which we'll know because the river is frozen. So. Sundays before dinner, we usually went down to the river. That Sunday, however, my mother stayed in the house to finish her baking, so only my father came down with us, carrying his and Marie's skates slung over the hockey stick he rested on his shoulder. With the cold, which had shattered the schoolhouse's glass thermometer the week before, even my father wore a scarf over his face to protect him. My mother had swaddled Marie and me with so many layers of clothing that we had trouble with the steps. Still, the cold seeped through the layers like water, and we were eager to skate and warm ourselves a little. Down at the river, we set up a patch of snow at the banks, and my father helped Marie with her skates. He tied her laces and sent her off in the river. As he tied his own laces, she skated slowly toward the tip of the channel, pushing away from us with timid steps, like a newborn moose with shivering legs. The sun was already setting, and I could feel the temperature falling away and getting colder. Such a thing was even possible. I had my head bent down over my skates, and was pulling the laces tight, eager to take my stick and join the other boys playing shinny, when my father suddenly jumped from the snow on the bank, one skate still unlaced. He screamed in Marie's name, skates chewing the frozen water, flying toward the thin ice at the confluence of the two rivers. There was just a dark hole where Marie had broken through the ice and disappeared. Other men raced behind my father, but he was the first in the open water, screaming her name. For a moment, he stopped at the edge of the fissure. Suddenly we saw her, we all saw her gasping, bobbing, taking a last breath at the surface of the water, too cold or too scared to even scream, and as I reached the water, I saw my sister's eyes lock onto my father. He dove into the water, and then they were gone. I hesitated at the edge, staring at the water, and surprised at how smooth it was. Pearl grabbed my shoulder roughly. No, he said. 
the tiki were holding me back, and I realized that I had not even thought of following my father in. The black water in the hole in Marie's fall had opened up started icing, even as curled on my arm. The men yelled for rope, but then, not willing to wait, they linked arms, hurled the first one into the breach. I could see the shock in his face at the first touch of the water. It was a minute at most before the men walked back in the water, his skin on his hands gone white from the cold. He could not stand when they took him out, his legs shaking uselessly beneath him. The sun seemed to have fallen from the sky, pulling the temperature down with it. In the dark, I could barely see the hole in the ice freezing back over, like a mouth that had briefly gone open and was now closing again. Even though it was too late, another man and then another went into the river, reaching beneath the water to feel my father and Marie. As the last man was pulled from the water, the ice almost still shut around his legs as if the river wanted one more. It was Father Earl who brought my mother down the river, and she found the sitting around the bonfire the bank near the men with the blue cherry lips. Boiling sap and a burning pine log pot, setting up a shower of sparks. A few embers floated out over the river before dying in the night. Later, there were the other wives and mothers, quiet murmurs, curls sitting beside me, changing to dry clothes, with crying. And then, finally, my mother and I turning home. The winter punished us into December. Snow fell hard, our roof creaking until angry winds beat the white dust on the ground. The same winds cleared a great swath of snow from the sogman, until finally, between Christmas and New Year's, the sun came out and the men and children bundled against the cold, took their skates down the river again. Except for the whip of the wind and the crackling of wood in the stove, our house was quiet. The knock on the door sounded like a shot. Pearl led us to the river, helping my mother down the snow-crusted steps cut into the hill next to the log chute. Holding her arms, we walked across the ice to the small circle of men. The ice was smooth and clean from month of scouring from the wind. The hands were not touching. Even through the plate of frozen water covering them, we saw clearly that little more than the width of an axe blade separated my father's two hands from my sister's one. His mangled fingers on one hand, the smooth alabaster fingers on the other hand, all stretched toward Marie's small hand. The ice, like glass above the hand, <coughs> thickened as we tried to look further out to see the rest of their bodies and their faces. The lines blurred and the shadows, dark shapes. There was talk of axes, of chopping at the ice, but my mother forbade it, as if they suggested pulling my father and Marie from their graves, and then the men left, gliding away from us on their skates. Pearl touched me on the back and headed toward the bank, leaving my mother and me for the ghosts of our family. As the sun dropped below the peak of the hill, we turned from the ice and trudged back up the steps, holding aside the log sheet for balance. I woke in the middle of the night, thinking I heard Marie calling me. Out the window, something looked wrong, as if the entire world were underwater with my father and Marie, and I realized that thin sheets of rain were falling from the sky, icing the trees, turning all of Sodom into a frozen river. I went to check the fire in the stove, and I saw the axe no longer hung above the door. The steps beside the log chute were slick, and the mist was stark white, with neither water nor ice, diamonds falling from the sky. When I reached the river, my mother was swinging the axe. The ice shone below her as if the river had swallowed the moon, the, and the sound of the axe hitting the ice was ringing and clear like metal on metal. I walked close to my mother, and I almost expected the river to shatter under the sharp oil blade, the ice to cleave beneath our feet. The river would take us and freeze us alongside my father and Marie, or my father would step from the open ice himself, pulling Marie behind it, holding her hand, the four of us walking the house, where we could sit in front of the fire, and he could tell stories of fish made of ice. My mother kept swinging the axe, and between the pains of the blade skittering off the surface of the ice, I heard her crying. She stopped when she saw me and fell to her knees, shaking. I knelt beside her. The ice was so smooth and clean as if she'd never been here with the axe. And when I put my hand flat on the ice, it was warm against my palm, like bread cooling from the oven. Then the light beneath the river disappeared, leaving us on the ice, the film of rain covering us. In the house, my mother covered me up with my blanket and kissed me on my forehead. I'm sorry she said, so quietly that I was unsure whether she'd really spoken or I'd only imagined it. Cheers.